Welcome back. April 23rd, 2021. I should like to try an experiment and without further comment, read a few things most once counted or perhaps someday in the near future will once again count and consider classics. They speak to me just now given our two most prominent social and civic stressors, race and virus both of which I think bring us problems based on some form of abnormal psychology that alloys authoritarian personality syndrome to homicidal fantasy to paranoid personality disorder to Munchausen by proxy and racism. Hence, we end up with a country I think rightly described today by Peggy Noonan as swerving too much, a country that gets its remedies wrong that unthinkingly overcorrects because we've abandoned earlier time-tested common sense learnings, teachings. So some readings. In 1939, C.S. Lewis gave a famous sermon, Learning in Wartime. Here's part of what he said. The war creates no absolutely new situation. It simply aggravates the permanent human, situ human situation so that we can no longer ignore it. Human life has always been lived on the edge of a precipice. Human culture has always had to exist under the shadow of something infinitely more important than itself. If men had postponed the search for knowledge and beauty until they were secure, the search would never have begun. We are mistaken when we compare war with normal life. Life has never been normal. Even those periods which we think most tranquil, like the 19th century, turn out on closer inspection to be full of cries, alarms, difficulties, and emergencies. Plausible reasons have never been lacking for putting off all merely cultural activities until some imminent danger has been averted or some crying injustice put right. But humanity long ago chose to neglect those plausible reasons. They wanted knowledge and beauty now and would not wait for the suitable moment that never comes. Periclean Athens leaves us not only the Parthenon, but significantly the funeral oration. The insects have chosen a different line. They have sought first the material welfare and security of the hive, and presumably they have their reward. Men are different. They propound mathematical theorems in beleaguered cities, conduct metaphysical arguments in condemned cells, make jokes on scaffolds, discuss the last new poem while advancing to the walls of Quebec, and comb their hair at Thermopylae. This is not panache. It is our nature. About ten years later, C.S. Lewis wrote this now famously revived essay. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age is the question of the day, and I am tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the, in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in the Viking Age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of automobile accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented, and quite a high percentage, a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is per perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and which, in which death itself was not a chance at all but a certainty. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull yourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pinting game of darts. 
not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, any microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds, close quote. In his 1950 speech accepting the Nobel Prize, William, Falk William Faulkner spoke thusly, quote, Our tragedy today is a general and universal physical fear so long sustained by now that we can never even bear it. There are no longer problems of the spirit. There is only the question, when will I be blown up? One must now then learn the problems of the human heart. One must teach himself that the basis of all things is to be afraid, and teaching himself that, forget it forever, leaving no room in his workshop for anything but the old verities and truths of the heart, the old universal truths lagging which, lacking which any story is ephemeral and doomed, love and honor and pity and pride and compassion and sacrifice. Until he does so, he labors under a curse. Some of us refuse to accept this, for I believe that man will not merely endure but prevail. He is immortal not because he alone among creatures has an inexhaustible voice, but because he has a soul, a spirit capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. The poets, the writer's duty is to write about these things. It is, his it is his privilege to help man endure by lifting his heart, by reminding him of the courage and honor and hope and pride and compassion and pity and sacrifice which have been the glory of his past. The poet's voice need not merely be the record of man. It can be one of the props, the pillars, to help him endure and prevail. A soul, a spirit, capable of compassion and sacrifice and endurance. You've heard me mention the short story Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut, first published in 1961, a few excerpts. Quote, the year was 2081, and everybody was finally equal. They weren't only equal before God and the law, they were equal every which way. Nobody was smarter than anybody else. Nobody was better looking than anybody else. Nobody was stronger or quicker than anybody else. All this equality was due to the 211th, 212th, and 213th amendments to the Constitution and to the unceasing vigilance of agents of the United States Handicapper General. Some things about living still weren't quite right, though. April, for instance, still drove people crazy by not being springtime, and it was in that clammy month, that clammy month of April, that the H.G. men, you know, the uh, handicapper general men, took George and Hazel Bergeron's 14-year-old son, Harrison, away. It was tragic, all right, but George and Hazel couldn't think about it very much. Hazel had perfectly average intelligence, which meant she couldn't think about anything except in short bursts. And George, while his intelligence was way above normal, had a little mental handicap radio put in his ear. He was required by law to wear it at all times. It was tuned to a government transmitter. Every 20 seconds or so, the transmitter would send out some sharp noise to keep people like George from taking unfair advantage of their brains. It would scatter the thoughts. George and Hazel were watching television. There were tears on Hazel's cheeks, but she'd forgotten for the moment what they were about. On the, tev on the television screen were ballerinas. A buzzer sounded in George's head. His thoughts fled in a panic like bandits from a burglar alarm. That was a real pretty dance, that dance they just did, said Hazel. Huh? said George. That dance, it was nice, said Hazel. Yup said George. He tried to think a little about the ballerinas. They weren't really very good, no better than anybody else would have been anyway. They were burdened, after all, with sash weights and bags of birdshot, and their faces were masked so that no one seeing a free and graceful gesture or a pretty face would feel like something the cat drug in. George was toying with the vague notion that maybe dancers shouldn't be handicapped. But he didn't get very far with it before another noise in his ear radio scattered his thoughts. George winced. So did two out of the eight ballerinas. Fast forward 
1983, when Ronald Reagan said this in his Evil Empire speech, quote, A number of years ago, I heard a young father, a very promising young man in the entertainment world, addressing a tremendous gathering in California. It was during the time of the Cold War, and communism and our own way of life were very much on people's minds. And he was speaking to that subject, and suddenly I heard him saying, I love my little girls more than anything. And I said to myself, Reagan said, oh, no, don't. You can't. Don't say what you're going to say. But I had underestimated him, and he went on, quote, I would rather see my little girls die now, still believing in God, than have them grow up under communism and one day no longer believing in God, close quote. There were thousands of young men in that audience. They came to their feet with shouts of joy. They had instantly recognized the profound truth and what he had said with regard to the physical and the soul and what was truly important, close quote. Finally, I offer this. Hadley Arcus was touring the Holocaust Museum in Washington and came upon the vast vat filled with shoes. He wrote, they were the shoes of the victims collected by the Nazis as they sought to extract anything they could use again or sell. And what came flashing back instantly at that moment were the searing lines of Justice John McClain and his dissenting opinion in the Dred Scott case. Quote, you may think that the black man is merely chattel, but he bears the impress of his maker and is amenable to the laws of God and man, and he is destined to an endless existence. Close quote. He has, in other words, a soul which is imperishable. It will not decompose when his material existence comes to an end. The sufficient measure of the things here is that the Nazis looked at their victims and thought that the shoes were the real durables. In all this, what I'm saying is let us not replace common sense with fear. Let us not replace care with paranoia. Let us not replace freedom with authoritarianism. Let us not replace equality with equity or death wishes of others. Let us not replace the class war of Marx with the race war of Hitler. Let us not replace our understanding of who we are, why we were founded, and the natural law understanding of truths and civic responsibility. Let's not replace that with rewritten history, junk thought, and the triumph of the will. I'm Seth Leapson. We'll be right back.